Okay, hello and welcome back to Grockets OG TV. My name is Jim Jacobson, and I'll be the one uh, with you today going through the official guide to the test. This is the GMAT edition of the OG TV. We're going through that 12th edition, the one with the purple cover and the gold letters on the front. Um, I don't know if they're strictly speaking gold. Uh, the color might be goldenrod or some other thing, so you'll forgive me if you know your colors better than I do. Um, and maybe it's more maroon than purple, and anyway, you get the idea. It says 12th edition on the cover, so yeah, that's how you know you have the right one. And when we left off last time, we were in the middle of the critical reasoning section. <clears throat> we had left off on the previous page, page 501, with the last question on that page, number 54. Um, and so we're going to pick up on uh, page 502 with question number 55. And as before, if this is your first time listening to the broadcast, you do need to have your copy of the book in front of you. Uh, I will be reading the critical reasoning uh, passages and questions and answer choices to you, um, but it does require your own copy in front of you for reference because I'm not going to go back and reread it, you know, multiple times, um, probably, anyway. Um, and, yeah, I guess that's probably all you need to know. So let's get started. So number 55, insurance company X is considering issuing a new policy to cover services required by elderly people who suffer from diseases that afflict the elderly. Premiums for the policy must be low enough to attract customers. Therefore, company X is concerned that the income from the policies would not be sufficient to pay for the claims that would be made. Which of the following strategies would be most likely to minimize company X's losses on the policies? Okay, so the argument does specific, so in this case, the question stem where it asks us the actual question, it does do a little summarizing what the argument we, you know, it summarizes a little bit of the argument that we need, um, which is that, uh, that we need, which, the correct answer will be a strategy that will minimize the losses on the policy. So this one, unlike, so again, in every other broadcast, I've mentioned how wrong answer choices often involve money or time when the argument is not actually about that. There are, of course, critical reasoning arguments that are about money or time, and this is one of them. Clearly, and I'm going to use green because, you know, money, uh-huh. Um, clearly, this one is about money. So uh, we need an answer choice that will cause them to not lose so much money. It should, in theory, be easy to pick that out of the group. Choice A, um, so these are all strategies that they could use. Choice A, attracting middle-aged customers unlikely to submit claims for benefits for many years. Let's think about that for a sec. If the middle-aged customers are not elderly, they do not have diseases that afflict the elderly, but and they don't get sick for many years, um, but they continue to pay premiums into the insurance for many years, that is something that would mitigate the losses. Um, maybe they don't lose money at all necessarily, so let's keep choice A to, and keep reading. Uh, strategy B, ensuring only those individuals who did not suffer any serious diseases as children. So this one's a question of scope. Um, the lack of serious diseases as children has little to no relation to the diseases that afflict the elderly. Remember that did say that in the passage, that we're dealing with diseases that afflict the elderly. So childhood diseases are typically very different. So uh, choice B, not it. Uh, choice C, including a greater number of services in the policy than are included in other policies of lower cost. So while that might justify a higher cost, the uh, passage itself said that they were anticipating uh, selling it at a lower cost. So this is something that would make costs go up, which is contrary to the goals stated in the passage. So that's not right. Uh, choice D, um, ensuring only those individuals who were rejected by other companies for similar policies. Um, that just sounds like a terrible idea. If you're trying to save money, uh, typically people are rejected for insurance because um, they they present too high a risk, you know, too high a risk that the company won't be able to earn its money back. So um, definitely not D. And then choice E, ensuring only those individuals who are wealthy enough to pay for the medical services. Well, I suppose those who are wealthy enough to pay for the medical services could in turn pay for the insurance, but they probably won't be able to get that many customers. 
Um, and so these are people who wouldn't necessarily even pay for, wouldn't even want the insurance anyway. So that doesn't really make sense for their strategy. Um, because they probably wouldn't sell any, and they do actually need to sell them. So uh, that leaves us with choice A. Get people started sooner so that um, they um, pay more into the insurance as they go. Okay. So on to still page 502. We're not really moving on in that respect. Question number 56. The fewer restrictions there are on the advertising of legal services, the more lawyers there are who advertise their services. And the lawyers who advertise a specific service usually charge less for that service than the lawyers who do not advertise. Therefore, if the state removes any of its current restrictions, such as the one against advertisements that do not specify fee arrangements, overall, legal, overall consumer legal costs will be lower than if the state retains its current restrictions. If the statements above are true, which of the following must be true? So the way this is worded, there's an inference. There's nothing that we could have um, predicted in advance, but we do still want to summarize the argument. The argument overall, basically the part that starts with therefore, um, is that removing any restrictions um, will reduce the cost. Any restriction at all will reduce the cost. That's what the argument says. If the state removes any of its current restrictions, um, overall consumer legal costs will be lower. So, um, possibly the inference will relate to that. We can't know for sure, but it, it, it is always good to practice summarizing the argument. Moving on uh, to the answer choices. Choice A, some lawyers who now advertise will charge more for specific services if they do not have to specify fee arrangements in the advertisements. So this sounds, quite frankly, wrong. Uh, remember that the main argument is about how costs will go down if restrictions are lifted. This one has a restriction being lifted and costs going up, or fees going up. So that does not sound like a likely inference from the passage. Choice B, more consumers will use legal services if there are fewer restrictions on the advertising of legal services. So again, the passage, maybe this is worth writing down. Um, Overall, um, what do they say? Overall consumer legal costs. Uh, go down um, with fewer restrictions. <laughs> fewer restrictions. I do know English, really. I just, talking while I'm writing leads to more typos, more mistakes. Anyway, so um, choice B um, is not about consumers, the passage, none of the passage is about consumers use of legal services. So that's basically irrelevant. Um, and we're able to uh, eliminate choice B based on scope. Uh, choice C, if the restriction against advertisements that do not specify fee arrangements is removed, more lawyers will advertise their services. So choice C has a restriction being lifted, fewer restrictions, that. And then it says um, more lawyers will advertise their services. Um, that sounds possible. So that's not actually what we have here. But the passage does say um, also the fewer restrictions there are on the advertising of legal services, the more lawyers there are who advertise their services. So fewer restrictions leads to uh, both overall consumer legal costs going down and more advertisements. I guess I didn't summarize the argument fully. But the passage does say that fewer restrictions means more advertisements. And so uh, choice C has us removing a restriction on a specific type of or a, spe a specific aspect of advertisement that should still lead to more advertisements according to the passage. So this one's kind of tempting. Let's keep going. If more lawyers advertise lower prices for specific services, some lawyers who do not advertise will also charge less than they currently charge for those services. So the passage is not about competition between the advertising lawyers and the non-advertising lawyers, although that would be a factor in real life. Um, it's not a factor in the passage. 
Choice E, if the only restrictions on the advertising of legal services were those that apply to every type of advertising, most lawyers would advertise their services. So this one, this is one that starts out actually very promising. Um, you know, we're, it starts off with if the only restrictions were those that apply to all ads. Okay, so that sounds good. That sounds like a lowering of restrictions on legal advertisement, which is what our argument was about. But then it goes on to say most lawyers would advertise their services. While the passage does say that fewer restrictions mean more advertisements, there's not enough support in the passage for the idea that most lawyers would advertise if the restrictions were just, um, you know, wh whatever apply to other um, advertisements. So choice E um, starts out right and then goes off the rails in the second half of the of the answer choice. A minus anywhere though in the answer choice makes it wrong so it's not E. It is in fact answer choice C. Still page 502 and question number 57. Which of the following most logically completes the argument given below? So in case we didn't notice the big blank at the end uh, the question uh, actually tells us. So people in isolated rainforest communities tend to live on a largely vegetarian diet and they eat little salt. Few of them suffer from high blood pressure and their blood pressure does not tend to increase with age as is common in industrialized countries. Such people often do develop high blood pressure when they move to cities and adopt high salt diets. Though, suggest uh -huh. Though suggestive, these facts do not establish salt as the culprit in high blood pressure, however, because blah. Okay, so we are dealing here once again with a causal argument. So remember we have, you know, X causes Y. Um, in this case, um, the move to the city and especially the high salt in the city leads to um, high blood pressure. And to weaken a causal argument, and even though this question isn't actually asking us, it doesn't say which of the following weakens the argument in the passage, um, that's what the final sentence of the passage is actually doing. It's asking us to weaken the argument. It says, though suggestive, these facts do not establish salt as the culprit in high blood pressure, however, because, and then we need a reason for that. And so remember, to weaken causal arguments, you can do it one of three ways. And we've seen, I think, all three in the course of the critical reasoning section so far. One is to say, um, yeah, you know, actually um, moving to the city and, and, and its high salt diet doesn't really cause high blood pressure. Other people have moved to the city in the high salt diet and their, high blo their blood pressure didn't go up. That's what, that's what this one would be. The other one you could say is that it's actually Y that causes X. In this case, that uh, high blood pressure causes people to move to the city and adopt a high salt diet. That makes no sense in this particular case, so we can you know, get rid of this one. The other, the other way you can do it is that you can say, the third way that you can weaken causal arguments, so these are ways number one, two, and three. The other way you could do it is that to say that Z causes Y. So we would say that something else in this case causes high blood pressure. So uh, basically for our purposes, the right answer will be one of these two things. It'll either be number one or number three. It'll say that move, moving to the city and the high salt diet don't necessarily mean high blood pressure just because these people get it. I mean, other people have done it and they don't get the high blood pressure. That would be correct. Or if it's something else that causes the high blood pressure other than the high salt diet specifically. Because that's what the uh, passage is about. It says, uh, these facts do not establish salt as the, cul as the culprit in high blood pressure. Again, on the real GMAT, it would not take you this long to do what I just did. Uh, this is more like a teaching portion, so, you know, that uh, don't factor that in and, and say, oh my gosh, I'll never be able to do causal arguments. That took five minutes. Um, it, you know, obviously it's faster when you do it in your head than when you have to explain it to the internet. Also, if you get good enough and practice enough at doing these uh, causal argument type things, this comes very quickly to you. Okay, so choice A. Genetic factors could account for the lack of increase of blood pressure with age among such people. So that could be true. 
However, it doesn't specifically deal with, again, th this, the answer choices are finishing a sentence saying that salt is not the culprit for high blood pressure. So saying that they have genetically low blood pressure doesn't address why salt isn't the reason. Choice B, people eating high salt diets and living from birth in cities and industrialized societies generally have a tendency to have high blood pressure. So this actually strengthens the, the link between salt and high blood pressure, which is not what we want at all. We want the reverse. Uh, choice C, it is possible to have a low salt diet while living in a city in an industrialized country. Probably true, but doesn't really um, tell us that salt's not the culprit. Choice C, basically remove salt from the picture. Uh, choice D, there are changes in other aspects of diet when such people move to the city. So this is saying that something else, perhaps, in their diet is causing high blood pressure. So choice D is our Z causes Y rather than X causes Y. And so, I mean, really, it just leaps off the page as doing that. But let's look at E anyway. Uh, choice E, salt is a necessity for human life, and death can occur when the body loses too much salt. So while unfortunate and true, it is outside the scope of the passage. Again, we needed a reason to dissociate salt from, from high blood pressure. Only choice D does that. And we can move on. Page 502, question number 58. Even though most universities retain the royalties from faculty members' inventions, the faculty members retain the royalties from books and articles they write. Therefore, faculty members should retain the royalties from the educational computer software they develop. The conclusion above would be more reasonably drawn if which of the following were inserted into the argument as an additional premise. So this is a very strange way to, well, I'm sorry, it's not that it's very strange. This is an atypical way for a question to be worded. This question is ultimately asking what the assumption is. And the, the reason it's worded this way is that the assumption is a rather large one, and the argument would be stronger if the assumption were actually stated rather than um, remaining the unstated evidence. So um, what we're looking for is a missing connection between the evidence cited and the conclusion drawn. That missing link between the two is the current assumption that, if stated as an actual premise in the argument, would make it much stronger. So um, universities retain royalties from inventions. Um, faculty members retain royalties from books and articles. Therefore, faculty members should retain the roy royalties from educational computer software. So we have two categories. We have inventions. In that case, the university gets to keep the money. Um, books, the faculty get to keep the money. Um, software, they are saying, the author of the passage is saying, the faculty should keep the money. So um, the link here perhaps would be saying that in some way, um, software and books have um, that uh, legally, perhaps, software is, is more akin to books in terms of how royalties are determined, or that according to the faculty rules, uh, the way that that's written, um, or that the way those are written, um, that books, that the act of writing somehow links these two. Basically, since the justification is that since books, since faculty get to keep the royalties for books, therefore they should get to keep the royalties for software, what we're missing is some kind of connection between books and software. Um, or, conversely, an opposition uh, between software and inventions. I guess that's also possible. So this, we would need a positive link here or a negative link here, um, saying that, yeah, you know, software isn't really like an invention at all, and therefore those rules shouldn't apply. So we need something like that in the answer choices. Let's go hunting for it. Choice A, royalties from inventions are higher than royalties with, from educational software programs. This is one of those false uh, distinctions, you know, creating a distinction between two things that is basically irrelevant to the argument. Saying that the amount of royalties between them is different is irrelevant. It's not based on amount of royalties, it's whether the faculty get to keep them at all. Uh, choice B, faculty members are more likely to produce educational software programs than inventions. 
Uh, both of these would be important distinctions to be made if you were the university deciding whether faculty members should be allowed to keep their royalties. I mean, if that's something that the university gets to decide, which actually frequently they don't. Um, but the amount of money that you would get and what faculty members produce more as income streams for the university would be very relevant. Not at all relevant to our argument, though. We need to connect books and software or disconnect inventions and software. Choice C, inventions bring more prestige to universities than do books and articles. Prestige, oh my gosh. Totally outside the scope. Uh, choice D, in the experience of most universities, educational software programs are more marketable than our books and articles. Again, scope, nobody cares about marketability. We want connections justifying um, the, the notion that faculty should get to keep the royalties from educational computer software. Um, anyway, uh, choice E, in terms of the criteria used to award royalties, educational software programs are more nearly comparable to books and articles than to inventions. So there's our positive link between books and articles and software. Um, that, as at, if that were added to the argument, it would strengthen the connection to the conclusion. Choice E is our correct answer. All right, on to page 503 and question number 59. Are you as excited as I am? No way of knowing. Okay, so in order to withstand tidal currents, juvenile horseshoe crabs frequently burrow in the sand. Such burrowing discourages barnacles from clinging to their shells. When fully grown, however, the crabs can readily withstand tidal currents without burrowing, and thus they acquire substantial populations of barnacles. Surprisingly, in areas where tidal currents are very weak, juvenile horseshoe crabs are found not to have significant barnacle populations, even though they seldom burrow. Which of the following, if true, most helps to explain the surprising finding? So, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Uh, the explain questions usually seem to be the easiest to me personally. Uh, I don't know why I shared that with you, oh, internet. But, um, you know, as long as you summarize the argument correctly, the correct answer should leap off the page for you. We need a reason why the young don't have barnacles. That's it. The correct answer choice will have the young horseshoe crabs not collecting enough, not collecting many bar barnacles, even though they don't burrow under the sand. Okay, let's find a reason why they don't have barnacles. Uh, choice A, tidal currents do not themselves dislodge barnacles from the shells of horseshoe crabs. Well, if anything, this would um, make it even more mysterious why they don't have barnacles, because if the tidal currents knocked barnacles off, um, then that might explain, no, that still wouldn't explain why the, why the um, juvenile crabs in weak current areas don't have barnacles. Anyway, choice A doesn't tell us why juvenile barnacle crabs don't have barnacles. Did I say ju juvenile barnacle crabs? I meant juvenile horseshoe crabs. Anyway, choice B, barnacles most readily attach themselves to horseshoe crabs in areas where tidal currents are weakest. This one definitely makes it more mysterious. So if, if barnacles are even keener on attaching to horseshoe crabs in um, weak tidal areas, it makes it even weirder that the juveniles don't have it because they're not burrowing in the sand. Choice C, the strength of the tidal currents in a given location varies widely over the course of a day. Nope, that doesn't explain why they don't have barnacles. Choice D, a very large barnacle population can significantly decrease the ability of a horseshoe crab to find food. Unfortunate, but does not explain why the juveniles do not have barnacles. Choice E, until they are fully grown, horseshoe crabs shed their shells and grow new ones several times a year. Well, so since the issue is, hey, nobody ever finds barnacles on horseshoe on these juvenile horseshoe crabs in, when the tidal forces are weak and they don't burrow, how could that be? Well, if they keep shedding off their skin, or shells, sorry, um, and growing new ones, that might actually explain it. The barnacles that did attach them disappear when they shed off their old shells. So choice E clearly gives us a reason why we don't observe too many barnacles on the shelves of juvenile horseshoe crabs in weak tidal areas. So again, to me, there's only one answer here that even comes close to explaining why, ju why juvenile horseshoe crabs 
don't have barnacles all over them. But, you know, that's just me. Anyway, explained questions are not that common, so it being the one I like the most or have the easiest time with really is kind of irrelevant. It is good to know, though, which ones you like more and which ones find easier. you find easier so that you can target your own studies correctly. Moving on. So, page 503, still page 503, question number 60. Red blood cells in which the malarial fever parasite resides are eliminated from a person's body after 120 days. Because the parasite cannot travel to a new generation of red blood cells, any fever that develops in a person more than 120 days after that person has moved to a malaria-free region is not due to the malarial parasite. Which of the following, if true, most seriously weakens the conclusion above? Again, that conclusion, which we need to re-familiarize re ourselves, with which we need to re-familiarize ourselves, is that any fever that develops in a person more than 120 days after that person has moved to a malaria-free region is not due to the malarial parasite. Okay. And so to weaken, you know, again, when we have um, evidence plus assumption equals conclusion, um, uh, so uh, greater than 120 days does not equal malaria. So that's the conclusion. The evidence is that um, uh, just trying to think of how to summarize it. Malaria in red blood cells um, is less than or equal to 120 days. So in this particular case, uh, so very often you can look for things that appear in the conclusion that don't appear in the evidence um, that uh, for, for, for clues for what is in the assumption. In this particular case, actually, the conclusion, though, has less than what's in the evidence. And so sometimes you can imagine that the assumption is uh, sometimes a subtraction. And in this case, what's missing um, is red blood cells from the conclusion. And so perhaps the assumption here might be um, that malaria can only be in red blood cells. It's certainly not stated. If the malaria can exist somewhere else, um, or you know, can move somewhere else. It says it can't travel to a new generation of red blood cells. What if it can go somewhere else? Or what if it, it can just live somewhere else? What, it can live, what if it can live in your skin? I don't know anything about malaria um, other than it comes from mosquitoes or it's transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, anyway, so the assumption here clearly um, is that red blood cells are the only place that malaria can exist because they go from this fact about how malaria dies after, um, or you know, it, it's it's gone after 120 days, and therefore anything after 120 days can't be malaria. The assumption here is that that's the only way that malaria could be in the body. Basically, let's take a look in the answer choices for another way that malaria could stay in the body for more than 120 days. Choice A: The fever caused by the malarial parasite may resemble the fever caused by flu viruses. The nature of the fever is a little bit outside the scope. It certainly could explain why somebody um, looked like they had malarial fever for more than 120 days, but even so, um, that's not what the question actually is about. Uh, gosh, I didn't even look up how to pronounce this word. The Anopheles mosquito? That's how I'm guessing it's pronounced, but I could be wrong. The Anopheles mosquito, which is the principal insect carrier of the malarial parasite, has been eradicated in many parts of the world. Good to know outside the scope. Choice C, many malarial symptoms other than the fever, which can be suppressed with anti-malarial medication, can reappear within 120 days after the medication is discontinued. Well, you know, reappearing within 120 days after the medication is discontinued doesn't necessarily mean that the person had malaria more than 120 days. If they give the medication for five days and then it reappears 100 days later, it's still within 105 days of infection. Um, so yeah, choice C uh, just doesn't really do anything. It's kind of irrelevant. Uh, choice D, in some cases, the parasite that causes malarial fever travels to cells of the spleen, which are less frequently eliminated from a person's body than are red blood cells. 
So here's a way that, um, so the assumption here again was probably some something like malaria is nowhere else, therefore the limit on malaria is 120 days. Here we have ma malaria able to live in the spleen, which, you know, is somewhere else, and that sounds like our answer, but let's check choice D, or E, I mean. In any region infested with malaria carrying mosquitoes, there are individuals who appear to be immune to malaria. That's great, but also irrelevant. So choice D has a place that malaria can go other than red blood cells, which, and those uh, they can live there longer than 120 days. So we could, that would absolutely weaken the conclusion if red blood cells were not the only place that malarial parasites could hang out. Choice D. Page 503, question number 61. Neither a rising standard of living nor balanced trade by itself establishes a country's ability to compete in the international marketplace. Both are required simultaneously since standards of living can rise because of growing trade deficits and trade can be balanced by means of a decline in a country's standard of living. If the facts stated in the passage above are true, a proper test of a country's ability to be competitive is its ability to blank. Well, where do we find out about countries being competitive? It says, um, neither a rising standard of living nor balanced trade establishes a country's ability to compete both are required simultaneously. So I guess we need both to be there for a country to be able to compete. So a proper test of a country's ability to compete or its ability to be competitive is its ability to A, balance its trade while its standard of living rises. Well, I'm sorry, I keep pausing. It's just um, this one, it, Choice A is absolutely clearly the correct answer. Um, you know, it says right in the passage that um, our two factors are rising standard of living. So we have a rising standard and balanced trade. And so neither one on its own is enough to have a, a country competitive but both are required simultaneously. Therefore, the correct answer would have both of them simultaneously, and that's exactly what choice A says. Let's just look at the other ones to see how wrong they are and whether any of them might have tempted us if we had maybe, what if we had started with choice E? Let's start with choice E. Um, choice E, uh, a country's ability to keep its standard of living constant while trade deficits rise. Well, that actually um, is something that is hinted that could happen in the passage. You know that um, uh, that uh, standard of living can rise with growing trade deficits. So you could also, in theory, keep your standard of living constant while trade deficits go up. But that's not what makes a country competitive, according to the passage. So it's not E. Uh, choice D: decrease trade deficits while its standard of living falls. Again, we needed a rising standard of living and balanced trade. So this one, decrease trade deficits, sounds good but standard of living falls sounds bad. Um, actually, I should have done that for uh, E to keep standard of living constant. Don't want that. Trade deficits rise. Don't want that. Choice C, increase trade deficits while its standard of living rises. Again, mentioned by the passage as a possibility, but we don't want to increase trade deficits. We do want to increase standard of living. And then choice B, balance its trade. Totally want that. While standard of living falls, totally don't want that. So choice A is the one that has both elements in it. And that's a fact. Okay. On to page 504, which we don't actually quite finish on page 504. I was just double checking. Okay, number 62. When there is less rainfall than normal, the water level of Australian rivers falls and the rivers flow more slowly. Because algae whose habitat is river water grow best in slow moving water, the amount of algae per unit of water generally increases when there has been little rain. By contrast, however, following a period of extreme drought, algae levels are low even in very slow moving river water. Which of the following, if true, does most to explain the contrast described above? 
Again, my favorite, the explain question. So um, the argument as presented, or the, the fact that uh, we're, we're dealing with here is that, um, so let's see, we would have a continuum of high rain, low algae, because we'd have fast moving water, I spell algae right, uh, and then if we have um, low rain, we have high algae because the rivers are moving slow, more slowly. And then if we have a drought, which is very little rain, super dry weather, uh, we also have low algae. So we need to explain this because even, even though, uh, because uh, our, our fact that is the basis for establishing points number one and two is that um, algae grow best in slow moving water. So we need to explain point number three here on our list of points from the passage. And algae grow best in slow moving water. If we need to explain why the algae growth is lower in choice three, we need a reason why they don't grow as well. Perhaps they don't have slow moving water. Maybe for some reason the water moves more quickly or in the case of a drought, I mean, if it's super dry, maybe those conditions lead to algae growing less. Let's look for that in our answers. Choice A, during periods of extreme drought, the population of some of the species that feed on algae tend to fail. Well, that's a logical consequence of what the passage says, namely, you know, if there's not that much algae, the things that eat the algae are going to have trouble because their food isn't there, but that doesn't explain the low algae content during a drought. Choice B, the more slowly water moves, the more conducive its temperature is to the growth of algae. So this explains uh, why slow moving water gets us from number one to number two, but it does not explain how it gets us from two to three when the water is moving even more slowly in a drought. So it's not B. Uh, choice C, when algae populations reach very high levels, conditions within the river can become toxic for some of the other species that normally live there. That's very sad but it's also outside the scope. Um, so obviously when there's low rains, but not a drought, um, the slow moving water can uh, cause all sorts of algae and it can crowd out other creatures, makes it, make it toxic for them, whatever. But that doesn't explain why a drought also has low algae when it has super slow moving water. Choice D, Australian rivers dry up completely for short intervals in periods of extreme drought. So, um, Algae grow best in slow moving water. What if there is no water at all? Um, that sounds bad for algae. It says because algae whose habitat is river water grow best in slow moving water. If their habitat is river water and there's no water at all, that would explain why there's not so many of them if uh, the drought takes away all of the water. So choice D, pretty darn tempting. Let's check E. Except for periods of extreme drought, algae levels tend to be higher in rivers in which the flow has been controlled by damming than in rivers that flow freely. That's one of these uh, false distinctions, you know, creating a, a split between two types of things that don't actually affect the argument either way. So choice E, also not it. Choice D is the one. Lack of water, lack of habitat entirely, is a good reason for the population of any living thing to die out you know, have lower numbers, whatever. Choice D does it. Still page 504 and question number 63. When hypnotized subjects are told that they are deaf and are then asked whether they can hear the hypnotist, they reply no. Some theorists try to explain this result by arguing that the selves of the hypnotized subjects are dissociated into separate parts, and that the part that is deaf is dissociated from the part that replies. Which of the following challenges, which, which of the following challenges indicates the most serious weakness in the attempted explanation described above? So personally, I think this one's pretty tough. Um, so because we're asked to we're asked which question um, 
most weakens the argument, which, which, which of the following challenges, and it's kind of tricky to kind of figure this one out. Um, the argument is basically that the theory, in theory, um, the reason someone who's hypnotized is asked a question, you know, they've been told that they're deaf, can you hear me? They say no. They must have heard the hypnotist ask the question. So, um, which, so how could they, if they were actually deaf, they wouldn't have heard the question and they wouldn't have been able to respond. So um, clearly some part of the hypnotized subject is hearing and some part of it isn't, or is, it will say that it isn't because um, they say no. So we need a reason to, so, so their explanation for this is that there's, you know, multiple parts of the self, the part that hears and then the part that replies. And so the replying part of the person can hear, but the hearing part of the person can't or, you know, something. Um, so we need a reason to, um, so the part, the part that replied um, must have been able to hear because, so we're imagining that the, the person is dissociated, dissociated into uh, parts in the, 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 uh, the hypnotized subject is dissociated into different parts. There's the part that hears and the part that replies. So the part that hears is deaf and the part that replies says, no, I can't hear, I'm deaf, but it must have been able to hear. So if the, if, so if the replying part can hear and the hearing part cannot. We need to challenge that um, that theory for this question. Okay, so which of the following challenges indicates the most serious weakness in the attempted explanation uh, described above? Choice A, why does the part that replies not answer yes? So that's a good question. Um, again, we the, the question actually, or the, the passage says, the hypnotized subjects are dissociated into separate parts and that the part that is deaf is dissociated from the part that replies. So uh, the deaf part can't hear. And if you had been able to communicate with the deaf part, it would have said, no, I can't hear. But clearly in the uh, question, in the prompt, uh, huh, I'm, using, I'm mixing up all my terminology today. In the, in the passage, um, clearly the part that replies is the part that can hear. Um, and so in theory, it should say, yes, I can hear. Um, so that's actually choice A. Choice A says, why does the part that replies not answer yes? Because clearly it did hear because it answered. If it couldn't hear, it wouldn't have heard the hypnotist's question. So uh, you can see why this one's trouble to even think about, talking about dissociating people into different parts that I don't know. Yeah, anyway. Choice A sounds pretty good. Let's look at the other answer choices. Uh, choice B, why are the observed facts in need of any special explanation? Well, that, that may have been uh, your first reaction on hearing or reading this particular passage, um, but that's kind of, that's not really a weakness. You know, the weakness of an argument is, why are you even asking that? That's, that's never going to be the weakness of any argument ever. Choice C, not on the GMAT anyway. Uh, choice C, why do the subjects appear to accept the hypnotist's suggestion that they are deaf? Well, that's more, that's outside the scope. I mean, why, do, why does hypnotism even work at all? Who knows? Um, totally outside the scope. Choice D, why do hypnotized subjects all respond the same way in the situation described? Also outside the scope. We don't, it actually doesn't even um, say every subject responds exactly the same way. We can kind of infer it, but... You know, yeah, not necessarily there. Um, choice E, why are the subjects, why are the separate parts of the self the same for all subjects? Also outside the scope. Um, both of these, both choice D and E, uh, talk about what all subjects do the same. And, the, and the, the passage does say subjects do this, but... Um, you know, we aren't given the data that says that 100% of people, when this happens, this is how they responded. It's not quite that level of detail, so these just end up with, you know, kind of too great a scope. The scope is greater than what the passage actually has. Which is actually usually what happens, and I guess in a way, um, scope questions, you know, those false, those false uh, distinctions that I mentioned, those are often a narrowing of the scope beyond what the passage actually has. And then the other scope questions are actually the ones that 
you know, try to make the draw in bigger picture things that don't actually matter. So I guess uh, scope, an scope wrong answer choices are the most common ones. Anyway, choice A, why doesn't the part that replies answer yes, since it clearly heard the question, that's the big weakness of the argument in the passage. Okay, second to last one, page 504, question number 64. And we can tell already from the boldface um, print that that's, it's a boldface question. And we know we're going to be asked what those boldface statements are doing in the argument. So we need to pay close, close attention to the structure of the passage. A prominent investor who holds a large stake in the Burton Tool Company has recently claimed that the company is mismanaged, citing as evidence the company's failure to slow production in response to a recent rise in its inventory of finished products. It is doubtful whether an investor sniping at management can ever be anything other than counterproductive, but in this case it is clearly not justified. It is true that an increased inventory of finished products often indicates that production is outstripping demand, but in Burton's case it indicates no such thing. Rather, the increase in inventory is entirely attributable to products that have already been assigned to orders received from customers. In the argument given, the two boldface portions play which of the following roles? Um, so again, we want to do some predicting before we get to the answer choices. It makes it easier to uh, find the wrong, find the right answer, and eliminate wrong answers. Um, so the first boldface: um, prominent investor uh, claims that the company is mismanaged. The second one: it's basically the author saying, in this case, it is clearly not justified. And then everything after is kind of explaining why it's not justified. So. In this case, it is clearly not justified, sounds like the author's conclusion. And then the evidence to support it is after that. The first thing that the company is mismanaged is the prominent investor's conclusion. And then the evidence supporting that comes after it between the two boldface statements. So the first one is um, somebody's claim, and the second one is the author's conclusion. We need something like that in the answer choices. Uh, choice A, the first states the position that the argument as a whole opposes. That sounds true. Um, the second provides evidence to undermine the support for the position being opposed. That sounds not true. The second one is actually the conclusion. So half right, half wrong is wrong. Uh, choice B, the first states the position that the argument as a whole opposes. Yeah. Uh, the second is evidence that has been used to support the position being opposed. Nope, not evidence in the second case. So not it. Choice C, the first states the position that the argument as a whole opposes. Sounds familiar and good. Um, the second states the conclusion of the argument as a whole. That is what it is. Let's look at the other ones. Choice D, the first is evidence that has been used to support a position that the argument as a whole opposes. The first one is not evidence. The first one is the actual conclusion that's opposed. And of course, we could just stop there. The first half's wrong, so it's not going to be D. But um, the second provides information to undermine the force of that evidence. So that's super wrong. And then choice E, the first is evidence that has been used to support a position that the argument as a whole opposes. It's not evidence. It's the actual conclusion. The second states the conclusion of the argument as a whole. That is true. So choice C is the only one that correctly identifies both halves of the, or both boldface passages or sentences. Not even sentences, they're phrases. Um, clauses, I guess. Anyway, choice C. Last one. Page uh, 504 to 505. Question number 65. Excavation of the ancient city of Kurion on the island of Cyprus revealed a pattern of debris and collapsed buildings typical of towns devastated by earthquakes. Archaeologists have hypothesized that the destruction was due to a major earthquake known to have occurred near the island in AD 365. Which of the following, if true, most strongly supports the archaeologists' hypothesis? Um, okay, and so just a vertical scan of the answer choices all of them have dates in them, okay? So clearly, um, all of these answers are going to hinge on the dating of this earthquake. The earthquake is known to have happened near the island 
AD 365. So to strengthen the argument that the city is destroyed by that AD 365 earthquake, um, we need to strengthen the connection between the destruction of the city and the earthquake in the same year, if that makes sense. Let's take a look at the answer choices. Bronze ceremonial drinking vessels that are often found in graves, dating from years preceding and following AD 365, were also found in several graves near Kurion. So it sounds great except for the word following. If the city's destroyed in AD 365, there shouldn't actually be any burials after 365. Everyone is dead or moved on. So um, they, they, yeah, they want, they want the entire city to be destroyed, basically, in 365. And if they're finding evidence of people building stuff and making stuff and burying people and making bronze drinking vessels after AD 365, that weakens the connection to the uh, AD 365 uh, earthquake. Choice B, no coins minted after AD 365 were found in Kurion, but coins minted before that year were found in abundance. So it's almost like finding, you know, a diary that goes up to a certain date and stops. And then you say, well, that's when the person stopped writing. Um, that's not necessarily true, but it strengthens the evidence of the, the, the support for that conclusion. In this case, if there's no coins after 365, that strengthens the notion that the city went up to 365 AD and then stopped. As opposed to the other answer choice, choice A, which had it go up to 365 and beyond. So, um, choice B looks good. Let's check the other ones. Choice C, most modern histories of Cyprus mention that an earthquake occurred near the island in AD 365. That doesn't matter at all, actually. Who cares what modern histories say? We, we care about the actual archaeological evidence. Uh, choice D, Several small statues carved in styles current in Cyprus in the century, be century between AD 300 and AD 400 were found in Kurion. So if, uh, let's just put 300 here and 400 here, sorry for the crooked lines, choice D is saying that they found statues that are current in this time period, which is basically, you know, a little bit more than half of it is before the earthquake, which we do want to have, but if those things could have existed after the earthquake, that weakens the argument that everything was destroyed in 365. So choice D, too broad a time period, it goes beyond the date that we need it to go to. Choice E, uh, stone inscriptions in a form of the Greek alphabet that was definitely used in Cyprus after AD 365 were found in Kurion. So this absolutely weakens the argument. If they found writing that didn't even exist uh, or that was definitely used after AD 365, that does not strengthen the idea that the city was destroyed in 365. So we needed, we needed um, the archaeological record to go up to 365 and stop to say, hey, that's when the city was destroyed. So choice B is our correct answer. Okay, so that's the last one for today. I'm just going to check quickly check the Facebook page to see if uh, anybody had any questions about anything. It's going to take me a minute to navigate to that on my other computer over here. Uh, Solar 15th, is that today? Oh, that was yesterday. Um, yeah, it looks like nobody had any, any comments for today, so um, we'll just stop there. Good place to stop the broadcast. Last question anyway. Um, so next time we will pick up with question number 66 on page 505, and we'll do another 10 or so uh, critical reasoning passages, and hope to see you then. So tomorrow morning, well, morning for me, might be a different time for you. Hope to see you there.